by Thomas Hardy. Book One, the Three Women. One, a face on which time makes but little impression. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching the time of twilight, and the vast tract of unenclosed wild known as Edgin Heath embrowned itself moment by moment. Overhead, the hollow stretch of whitish cloud shutting out the sky was as a tent which had the whole heath for its floor. The heaven being spread with this pallid screen. And the earth with the darkest vegetation, their meeting line at the horizon was clearly marked. In such contrast, the heath wore the appearance of an instalment of night, which had taken up its place before its astronomical hour was come. Darkness had, to a great extent, arrived hereon, while day stood distinct in the sky, looking upwards. A furze cutter would have been inclined to continue work. Looking down, he would have decided to finish his faggot and go home. The distant rims of the world and of the firmament seemed to be a division in time, no less than a division in matter. The face of the heath, by its mere complexion, added half an hour to evening. It could, in like manner, retard the dawn, sad and noon. Anticipate the frowning of storms scarcely generated, and intensify the opacity of a moonless midnight, to a cause of shaking and dread. In fact, precisely at this transitional point of its nightly roll into darkness, the great and particular glory of the Egdon Waste began, and nobody could be said to understand the heat who had not been there at such a time. It could best be felt when it could not clearly be seen. Its complete effect and explanation lying in this and the succeeding hours before the next dawn. Then and only then did it tell its true tale. The spot was indeed a near relation of night, and when night showed itself, an apparent tendency to gravitate together could be perceived in its shades in the scene. The sombre stretch of rounds and hollows seemed to rise and meet the evening gloom in pure sympathy. The heath exhaling darkness as rapidly as the heavens precipitated it, and so the obscurity in the air and the obscurity in the land closed together in a black fraternization, toward which each advanced halfway. The place became full of a watchful intentness now, for when other things sank blooding to sleep, the heath appeared slowly to awake and listen. Every night its titanic form seemed to await something, but it had waited thus, unmoved, during so many centuries, through the crises of so many things. That it could only be imagined to await one last crisis, the final overthrow. It was a spot which returned upon the memory of those who loved it with an aspect of peculiar and kindly congruity. Smiling champagnes of flowers and fruit hardly do this, for they are permanently harmonious, only with an existence of better reputation as to its issues than the present. Twilight combined with the scenery of Egdon Heath to evolve a thing majestic without severity, impressive without showiness, emphatic in its admonitions, grand in its simplicity. The qualifications which frequently invest the facade of a prison with far more dignity than is found in the facade of a palace double its size. Lent to this heath a sublimity in which spots renowned for beauty of the accepted kind are utterly wanting. Fair prospects wed happily with fair times, but alas, if times be not fair, men have often or suffered from the mockery of a place too smiling for their reason, than from the oppression of surroundings over sadly tinged. 
Haggard Egden appealed to a subtler and scarcer instinct, to a more recently learnt emotion, than that which responds to the sort of beauty called charming and fair. Indeed, it is a question if the exclusive reign of this orthodox beauty is not approaching its last quarter. The new veil of Tempe may be a gaunt waste in Thule. Human souls may find themselves in closer and closer harmony with external things, wearing a somberness distasteful to our race when it was young. The time seems near, if it has not actually arrived. When the chastened sublimity of a moor, a sea, or a mountain will be all of nature that is absolutely in keeping with the moods of the more thinking among mankind, and ultimately to the commonest tourists, spots like Iceland may become what the vineyards and myrtle gardens of South Europe are to him now, and Hedelberg and Baden be passed unheeded. As he hastened from the Alps to the sand dunes of Schneeveninge, the most thoroughgoing ascetic could feel that he had a natural right to wander on Egden. He was keeping within the line of legitimate indulgence when he laid himself open to influences such as these. Colors and beauties so far subdued were, at least, the birthright of all. Only in summer days of highest feather did its mood touch the level of gaiety. Intensity was much more usually reached by way of the solemn than by way of the brilliant, and such a sort of intensity was often arrived at during winter darkness, tempests, and mists. Then Egdon was aroused to reciprocity, for the storm was its lover and the wind its friend. Then it became the home of strange phantoms, and it was found to be the hitherto unrecognized original of these wild regions of obscurity, which are vaguely felt to be encompassing about in midnight dreams of flight and disaster, and are never thought of after the dream till revived by scenes like this. It was at present a place perfectly accordant with man's nature. Neither ghastly, hateful, nor ugly, neither commonplace, unmeaning, nor tame, but like man, slighted and enduring, and with all singularly colossal and mysterious in its swarthy monotony. As with some persons who have long lived apart, solitude seemed to look out of its countenance. It had a lonely face. Suggesting tragical possibilities, this obscure, obsolete, superseded country figures in doomsday. His condition is recorded therein as that of heavy, furzy, briery wilderness. Brueria. Then follows the length and breadth and leagues. And though some uncertainty exists as to the exact extent of this ancient lineal measure, it appears from the figures that the area of Egdon, down to the present day, has but little diminished. To Beria Bruaria, the right of cutting heath turf, occurs in charters relating to the district. Overgrown with heath and moss, says Leland. Of the same dark sweep of country, here at least were intelligible facts regarding landscape, far-reaching proofs productive of genuine satisfaction. The untamable Ishmaelitish thing that Egdon now was, it had always been. Civilization was its enemy, and ever since the beginning of vegetation, its soil had worn the same antique brown dress. The natural and invariable garment of the particular formation, in its venerable one coat, lay a certain vein of satire on human vanity in clothes. A person on a heath, in raiment of modern cut and colors, has more or less an anomalous look. We seem to want the oldest and simplest human clothing, where the clothing of the earth is so primitive. To recline on a stump of thorn in the central valley of Egdon, 
between afternoon and night.